Welcome. Uh, thank you for joining me today. I'm very pleased to present our, uh, what I think will be a wonderful session, top 10 planning strategies to deepen client relationships. Um, I'm pleased to introduce our, our uh, speaker today, Jody King, who is a JD and a CPA. Jody is the leader of Fiduciary Trust's wealth planning practice. She's focused on developing customized wealth plans for clients that integrate all aspects of estate and financial planning. She prides herself on being an active listener, which helps clients to identify their true goals and serves as a foundation for all of their planning. Jody had previously served in the roles of Vice President and Investment Officer and Vice President and Director of Client Services at Fiduciary Trust. Prior to joining Fiduciary in 2009, she was a director at North Star Advisors, a multifamily office focused on complex multi-generational families. Before that, she was a senior manager in Ernst & Young LLP's personal financial counseling group. Um, Jody has about 50 minutes of prepared remarks, um, after which I will take questions. Um, please, as we go, put questions in the chat. Um, I will break in if necessary to uh, cover those questions while Jody speaks, but we'll definitely leave time at the end for uh, questions and answers. Um, with that, Jody, the floor is yours. Thank you, Dan. Thank you for the introduction and good afternoon, everyone. It's it's nice to be speaking to you today. So our topic today is what I consider to be, it's my opinion, of course, on the some of the top 10 planning strategies to deepen client relationships. So let's jump in. I really look at this as a relationship business. Everything we do is about relationships. I always say planning is about relationships between the individuals in the room and sometimes people not in the room, but it's also about the relationship people have with money. But when we think about our relationship with clients, our goal needs to be, in my opinion, that we want to make the relationship less transactional. We want to become their advisor, not just their investment manager. There's nothing wrong with being their investment manager, but when you become their advisor you, and the relationship develops, it becomes a much stickier, stickier relationship. So today I'm going to break it into two categories. The first is building the relationship and second strategies to do that. And the second is adding value to the relationship and strategies to do that. So let's jump in. There's gonna be four topics I'm gonna to talk about under building the relationship. First, we're gonna talk about being intentionally present and actively listening. We're gonna talk about the use of open-ended questions and why they work. We're gonna focus on what is important to them when we have our discussions with the clients. And we also need to acknowledge that we each have a relationship with money and how that can impact how we develop our relationships with clients. So first off, being intentionally present and actively listening. By being intentionally present, what I mean is when you come to the meeting, take a few moments beforehand, kind of focus on the fact that you're gonna be working with this individual, this family, focus on them, put your phone down, put your phone on silent, you know, shut your watch off, whatever you need to do. Even a vibrating phone can be distracting during a meeting. Clients will sense if you truly focus on them and what's important to them. So you gotta leave your distractions at the door. You wanna make sure the clients feel like they really matter because the meeting's about them, right? And that's how you build that relationship. Lots of times it's easier to strengthen and build the relationships and have them feel that you are really interested in being intentionally present when there's fewer people in the room. You know, sometimes you have to have more than just a few in the room, but it can be the more people there, the harder that is to have that feel be there. It can also be more challenging on Zoom. It's harder to read people and body language on Zoom and there's delays and it just makes it a little more awkward. It's not impossible, but it's just a little more difficult. So you just need to be aware of that. And then with being intentionally present, the second part of that is actively listening. And so um, I think, you know, my mom always said, you, know, you have two ears, one mouth, right? Listen more than you talk. But active listening is more than just being silent. It's actually engaging as you listen. People like to be heard. Psychologically, they'll feel closer to you if they share things with you that are important to them. And so that is, that is good for you to understand that when you have that conversation, when they're sharing, that is part of building the relationship. 
And with it being more about them than about you, it's important to really be listening and have them sense the fact that you're listening and that you care. When you listen, you will learn about them. You'll learn what connects you. You know, maybe it's a love of travel, maybe it's Rachmaninoff, maybe it's hockey. It could be anything, but you'll find those connections just by listening to them. You'll also learn about how they think about money and risk. And that becomes important as you work with their assets and as you work with them, right? Um, risk obviously is portfolio construction in many ways, right? And as you think about how you're going to construct their portfolio, when you think about how they're going to respond to your comments, it comes into how they think about money. And by really listening to them, you will start to pick up cues on this even before you ask the detailed questions. And really asking the right questions and listening in the right way, you'll learn about their goals, which is really important because I always say that I, I want we want to figure out what kind of life people want to leave, lead and have money help them do that as opposed to having money be the all end and where we're headed, right? So we want, we want to plan our life and have money support our life. And so the goals and what we want our life to look at is the, is the important piece there. So learning about that, but also when you listen closely, you're going to learn about their fears. And that's something that they're probably not going to say, I'm afraid of this, I'm afraid of that. They might. But learning about those fears and understanding those will also really help you work with them and help you become their advisor. Again, I said the goal here is building the relationship and becoming their advisor. And by understanding them at a different level, by really listening to them, by identifying their fears and what you can help them work through, then you become their advisor. So listening closely on that. Um, I think that's one, thinking about fears, everybody talks about goals, but thinking about the fears is something that I think we gloss over sometimes, but it's something that sh we should kind of acknowledge and be aware of. The knowledge you gain as you listen will help you be a better advisor for them, as I've said. You know, I always say people need to understand who the players are. You need to know, even if you have one spouse that's always the one on the phone, always the one on the email, always the one at the meeting, you need to know the other spouse's name, right? You need to know the kids' names. You need to know their relative ages, you know, make a note if, it, if they're, you know, Johnny's in second grade in 2023, note that because that's going to influence things as you go along. You know, when you start thinking about education planning, are there weddings we need to plan for? What's the estate plan look like? If they start to share things about their children, again, on this fear list, maybe they're not married to the most perfect person in the world. Maybe they have a substance problem. Maybe they're not motivated and they're worried about them, you know, getting a job, whatever the situation is, or they could have a special need that needs to be planned for. All those things are really important that you can learn by listening, and it's going to help you be a better advisor as we think about estate planning. Or maybe they have great philanthropic goals, and we need to take that into account as we're kind of working with them. All those things will come out as you talk. When I mentioned you need to know who both spouses are, you need to know their names. Ideally, you need to know both spouses because again, the relationship can take a lot of turns along the way and knowing both will help you in the long run. And I'll talk about that more in a minute. But when you're in the room, talk to both spouses, listen to both spouses, turn when one spouse talks a lot, turn to the other one, anything else. What are your thoughts on that? It really becomes important to be the advisor to both of them is you're going to have to connect with both of them. And the easiest way to do that is to talk to both of them, right? And my last point on being intentionally present and actively listening is this one. You need to focus on listening to understand and not focus on listening to respond. So I'm gonna say that again, focus on listening to understand and not so much on listening to respond. We all want to sound like we know what we're talking about. You know, we all, so we're oftentimes racing to make comments that show we're adding value, right? But if you really take a moment and listen to them to understand, it's okay to have a little pause to gather your thoughts and really respond to that. But you have to understand them first. If you are so focused while they are talking on how, what you're going to say next, and that sounding kind of intelligent, like you know what you're talking about, you're going to miss some of those finer points that really become the pieces that are going to um, become important, that are important to the relationship. Can everybody see my slides? 
I, I can't hear you, Dan. Uh, no, we're not seeing the slides. No, oh, I don't no. think they're being shared right now. I am so yes. sorry. No. I am so sorry. Is that better here? That's better. Okay. My apologies there. I thought they were being shared. Um, we, were, we were focusing on listening to understand. <laughs> That's good. That's what we want to do is focus on listening to understand. Um, and so again, the focus needs to be listen to understand and not listening to respond. You're going to respond, but you need to really take that moment and make sure that you're focusing on understanding them, understanding their fears, understanding their goals, knowing who their family is, knowing who they are. And then you can move on and move to be their advisor. The next thing I want to talk about is the use of open-ended questions. You know, what are examples of most open-ended questions? When I start with somebody new and you're meeting them for the first time, I'll often start with kind of what brings you in today? What's important to you? If I'm starting a planning relationship, you know, what's on your mind? You know, what do you look to accomplish from this? There's lots of different ways you can do it, and you'll find the questions that are right for you. But open-ended so that they can answer and whatever is top of mind will tell you what their goals are eventually, what their fears are, and start to open and deepen that relationship. The question is, you know, are there any updates since last time we sat down? And just pause and let them respond. How is the family? Another good point to pause and let them respond. You're going to learn a lot about what's going on. We're planning a wedding. So-and-so is going to college. This has happened. That has happened. All important. Um, one of the other things I always do is I always say, I have my own list of things I want to talk about today, but let's start with yours. Is there anything pressing? Is there anything you want to make sure we discuss? Because when you do that, one, they feel important. They like that. Makes you, they relate to you in a different way. But also, if there's something so top of mind to them, that they can't really listen to what you're saying until they get that off their kind of chest, if you will, that gives them the opportunity to do that. And I can tell you my clients, uh, it's interesting, after doing that for a while with them, they come in with a list. And lots of times there's things on there like, yeah, I will get to that in a little bit. What else do you have? Like there's some things we address quickly and there's other things that are like, yeah, I will get to that in a minute, right? And it's okay to do that, but know what's on their mind because that's gonna really help you again, be that advisor. Um, other considerations I always talk about with open-ended questions is pause. Pause longer than you think reasonable and listen. Pausing can be uncomfortable, right? It gives everyone a chance to think. And sometimes when they think, they'll respond. Or sometimes if they feel like there's really an opening, they'll respond. Again, another thing that's more difficult on Zoom because of the awkward like um, pauses that go on there with kind of the lags, but it's really important. And the biggest question I use on and on again is anything else. And it's usually the third or fourth anything else where you get the really good information from someone, the things that are going to really help you understand them. And you need to turn to the second spouse and say anything else, right? You really have to go through that. And when they say, no, there's nothing else, I always say, oh, and if anything else comes up, feel free to interrupt me. Because those are the things when they hit top of mind, they again, stop them from listening to you because they're thinking and focused on that. But also it's something that's really important to them. And you want to know that as their advisor. The third thing, or the, carrying on with open-ended questions here, um, the benefits to that is you'll learn their goals. You'll learn their fears, which I talked about earlier. You'll learn how to invest for them with their goals and possibly fears in mind, asset allocation, security selection, timeline. There's a lot of things that'll come out um, that isn't such a check the box transactional discussion. Remember I said initially, you want it, we want this to be more relationship driven than transaction driven. And that's why the open-ended questions will help you with that. You transition to being their advisors. And by talking to both spouses, which I mentioned earlier, listening to both spouses, having both of them feel heard, you become not his advisor or her advisor, but their advisor. And you have a better chance of maintaining that relationship longer, especially if there's a death or divorce potentially. I cannot tell you the number of times I've heard, you know, when I ask, you know, why are you looking for a new advisor or whatever? I felt invisible. I never connected. They never heard me. They were the advisor to my spouse, not really mine. So those types of things. And, th and that's really, you need to build the relationship with both sides there. 
Moving on to focusing on what's important to them. This is my third item in building the relationship. And the thing that we go when we talk about focusing on what's important to them, we want to focus less on what we want to talk about as the advisor and more about what they want to hear. And that doesn't mean I'm not going to tell them the things they need to know and sometimes have tough conversations. You have to do that, right? But just because something's interesting to you, it may not be interesting to them. And so think about where they are and what they need to know, what they need to hear. You know, going through 20 slides on the economy um, may be very interesting to you and may be great information and you are brilliant for being able to decipher that. But if, if in their ears, it turns into blah, 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 it's not going to help you build that relationship, right? Sometimes less is more on some pieces like that. And you have to satisfy the needs and expectations of both spouses. And that, you know, can be a challenge in and of itself, right, sometimes. But it's really important to think about what they need to hear, how they need to hear it. Keep it interactive whenever you can when you're building that relationship. Having it more interactive and less of a dissertation will serve you long, serve you well in the long run. And also being honest and authentic along the way. You know, they're going to sense it if you're not. And so being honest and authentic along the way. And again, you know, there's going to be tough discuss discussions when, you know, asset allocation may not perform. The markets are not predictable. We've learned that, right? But they're volatile. And sometimes that can be difficult. And those can lead to some tough discussions. But if you have a less transactional relationship built with them, and if you're focused more on their planning, and they know they're focused on their planning, it's going to help to smooth that relationship and smooth those discussions, especially if they have a financial plan in place where you can actually say, oh, you know, remember, if we go back to this, it still works. You calm their fears, and then you can continue to build the relationship, um, is what I would suggest. The fourth item I want to talk about here on building the relationship is know your relationship with money. This is your relationship with money. They have a relationship with money too, which you're going to pick up on as you listen to those open-ended questions and that active listening process. But we all have a relationship with money. Some of us have a more positive relationship than others. Um, you know, if you think back to your childhood, there's probably songs in your head, right? You know, penny saved is a penny earned. Um, and there's just a lot of them like that. I, I, I could name a few, but I'll stop because it's really... If we, if we think about how we think about money and we think about our first reactions to money and our first experiences with money, some of that is sticks in our head. Um, there's, there's some that have guilt over money. If there's inherited money, there can be guilt there sometimes, not always. Um, if you have a situation where somebody maybe started watching um, the markets, if you will, at a time that was very volatile, volatile in the markets, they may have a different perception of how investing goes and whether they're willing to invest and what their risk pro profile looks like than if they started watching when the market was just like on a tear up, right? And you have the same things there, depending on how you look at it, your perceptions, your reactions to money um, are going to influence how you react to people and how that relationship goes. And you should not let your relationship with money color your client and your relationship with your client. So you kind of need to check that at the door. Um, a little bit because, you know, a couple examples on the relationship with money that could um, impact how you respond. I think probably a lot of us listened to Morgan Housel a few weeks ago at the event, right? And remember the example on enough where there was, you know, kind of the one hedge fund manager that like wanted more, 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 and is very driven for more, 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 more. And the other person was like, you know, I have a lot already and it's enough. And so that goes back to the keys of their relationship with money, right? Is there enough? And, you know, drive is healthy. I'm not going to say it's not, but overdrive may not be. If someone's relationship with money is causing them to their health to suffer, their relationships to suffer in different pieces, you know, that's important. You need to kind of recognize that. Um, I think the other thing, you know, along with relationship to money is every time you interject something. So if you have a relationship with money situation that you interject, you change how the discussion goes with your client. And that goes with any time there's a discussion going on, um, whether it's about money or something else. And so you just need to be careful and think about how what you're saying impacts the conversation you're having as you become their advisor and really build that relationship. I do have one um, book here that 
I would suggest if you are interested in kind of relationship with money, George Kinder um, wrote a book, Seven Stages of Money Maturity. And um, George is, uh, he's one of the fathers of life planning, if you will. And this is a, a fairly easy read. And it really focuses on people and stories about relationship with money. And it helps to illustrate and just raise an awareness of as you start to think about your relationship and also as you think about other people's relationship with money and how that will impact your discussions because their reaction to your comments may vary greatly depending on their relationship with money. And so it's just good to be aware of that um, as you go along. So what have we talked about so far? We've talked about four strategies to be used to build your relationship with your client. Um, be intentionally present and actively listen. Don't be afraid to pause and really listen there. Use open-ended questions and then pause and get the responses. Talk to both parties. Try to focus your discussions on what's important to them. Get to know them and then try to respond to that and try to present in a way that makes sense to them and understand your relationship to money because it will impact the discussions you have and how you approach um, topics. I'm now gonna move on to adding value to the relationship and six strategies. And these are probably more traditional financial planning concepts, if you will, but not strictly so. And so the six topics I'm gonna to talk about here, first is retirement, second is Roth, risk management is the third, credit reports and frozen credit being the, the fourth, credit cards and debit cards and the differences, and then estate planning as a general topic. So let's jump into that. When I think about retirement, when I talk to people, I continue again with these open-ended questions I've talked about because I get so much more that I can really work with with people on that. When somebody says, I want to retire or I want to retire in five years, I say, what's that look like? What's retirement look like to you? And then I stop. And usually it takes them a little bit to process. Sometimes they'll have something really quick, but lots of times it takes them a little bit to process. And it might be, oh, I want to travel. I want to do more trips. I want to golf more. I want to do this. I want to do that. I want to just not have the job I have now, but I still want to do something. I want to volunteer, whatever. There's a lot of things that come out of that. Where they want to live may come out of that. Um, is that in my home? Is that in Florida? Is that a different home? Um, are there long-term care risks that I'm concerned about? All of those things can come out and you can you know, ask a few follow-up questions to that to, to get, gain more information. But understanding what their retirement looks like, again, it's gonna help you be a better advisor. It's gonna help you to manage their money better. Are you managing money because they wanna buy a different home because, or because they plan to travel and spend a lot more when their um, maybe employment income ends? Or what exactly does that look like? as you plan for them, as you think about how the numbers are gonna work and how the investments are gonna work. If someone is still working, you know, and they're, we're trying to picture retirement, it's always good to understand what they're saving today. You know, how much are they saving? Are they prioritizing retirement over children's education? And I always tell people, you gotta take care of your own retirement. There's ways to get your kids educated, but it's a lot harder to pay for your retirement if you haven't saved for that, if you haven't planned for that. So understanding what they're saving and are they saving appropriately is important. Um, and then the, the opposite of that is how much are they spending, right? I always say that one of the things that um, is interesting when somebody says, I'm not spending much. That may be true, but it could also be that they just aren't in touch with their spending. And you know, if you understand their income and they're not saving much and they're not spending much, then what's happening to the difference? They're probably spending it, but it's good to get in touch with that because you can only plan if you're working with the right numbers, right? So understanding what they're spending today. You don't need to be um, an authority on social security or on Medicare. But it's good to have an understanding of that or at least be able to point them in resources. A lot of people, regardless of their net worth, are interested in Social Security. And most people, regardless of net worth, are going to be on Medicare at some point. And so understanding those is just kind of too low-hanging fruit, if you will, in the retirement discussion. And then, you know, with retirement, anything and everything else can be on the table. Um, and, and the goals there, so, you know, sometimes they'll want a vacation home and you'll want to, you know, talk about that and a lot of different pieces there, how they're going to spend their time. Are they going to change their residency? 
Again, you don't have to be an expert in advisees, but spotting the issues, being the advisor that then connects them with the right parties to help them can be a good step if you're not the right person. My next topic is Roth. So Roth IRAs, Roth conversions, I love Roth. I just have to admit it. Like if you've ever listened to me or ever heard me, you know I'm going to say Roths are important and a great way to save. I view Roths as a form of tax diversification. If we're saving money in traditional retirement plans, we're going to pay income taxes as things come out of that, right? But with the Roth, we don't have to pay income taxes as they go out. We pay income taxes going in, which can be painful, I admit, but it provides us diversification and more optionality later going on. I always say kind of the worst asset to inherit is a traditional IRA because well, now we have to like roll it out more quickly, right? We got, if you're not a surviving spouse, it's gonna all be out within 10 years at the longest um, for the most part, a few exceptions, but consider it all out within 10 years unless you're in a special class or a special situation. And you're gonna pay ordinary income tax on every dollar that comes out versus the Roth, I can leave it in for 10 years beyond the, the death, and then I can take it out with no income tax consequences. So I get tax-free growth for another 10 years and, and that coming out. So that's it's my favorite asset to inherit. Um, a lot of people should have access to a Roth 401k at this point. Not a lot of people are using the Roth 401ks, not as many as I would hope. And actually, there's not a lot of people that are fully funding their 401ks anyway. Um, which is a great savings tool. You got to fund enough to get the company match, obviously, but funding fully funding that is a great savings tool. But with the Roth 401k, you know, it can be hard to, to want to pay more ordinary income tax today. But when you look at the tax-free growth in the timeline, and if, and if you have someone particularly that's going to be passing assets on to the next generation, even if you're in the top tax bracket, it can still make sense to utilize the Roth 401k. So becoming conversant on that and being able to talk to talk to people about that is going to help you to add value to the relationship. Converting a traditional IRA to a Roth IRA or a 401k to a Roth IRA, um, I always, you know, at this point, we all need to be aware of the mass millionaires tax if they are a mass resident, right? If you go over a million dollars on a tax return, we're going to pay that extra 4% tax beyond that in Massachusetts. Um, so something to be aware of, you can do Roth conversions piecemeal, like it's not an all or nothing. You can do you know, a little bit this year and kind of push it up the tax rate and a little bit next year and um, you know, do within the, the tax rates that you're willing to pay taxes in. Um, one of the things that I often caution people on, even if they are like, yes, I wanna do more Rothing, if they have a lot of charitable intentions um, it is more advantageous to potentially to have traditional IRAs also available um, so that you can do qualified charitable distributions where you can distribute up to $100,000 per year if you're over age 70 and a half when you make those distributions and not have that count in your taxable income. It can count against your required minimum distribution if you're beyond the RMD age. But if you do that with a Roth, you don't want to pay taxes today and then give that asset to charity so much. You want to go ahead and do that with a traditional IRA. Or if you want to do funding of a um, charitable bequest in your estate, you want to have a traditional IRA that's going to be doing that, not a Roth IRA. So just something to think about there um, on reasons why not to convert is because of what you're planning to do with it. Um, and whenever we're talking about anything that is a, a Roth or something like that, I start to think about our beneficiary designations up to date. It's an easy questions to ask, you know, do they reflect your wishes? That should be for IRAs, for 401ks, for 403bs. And also let's throw life insurance in on that to make sure that the beneficiary designations are appropriate. Again, if you know about the family, you might know someone has passed. Some situations have changed. There's been a divorce. You know, things may have changed. So you can be asking about these questions too, and remembering that. And also, you know, um, lots of times people were. It's becoming more popular or po with uh, some caveats of using trusts as IRA beneficiaries. And so you want to make sure that 
that's done in a way under the new SECURE Act and the proposed regs that are out that um, it's being done appropriately and being done kind of the best way possible to not incur taxes in a way that you don't want to in that trust administration. So again, all those details may be beyond where you're comfortable advising, but you should be comfortable asking the questions. And being their advisor sometimes is bringing the things to light, giving them the things to think about, trying to help them have the platform from which to make informed decisions, right? And that becomes the important piece there. Um, my next topic is risk management, right? Risk management is a lot of things. I'm translating in here into insurance. It's about choices along the way, but insurance. Um, life insurance is one topic. I don't sell life insurance, never have, don't plan to, but there are reasons to have life insurance, right? And whenever I think about insurance, I think that I asked, does the purpose of the insurance match the product? And this is a question you can ask whether you're selling insurance or not, right? Does the purchase match the product? Um, does the purpose match the product? And so part of that's amount, right? Do we have the right amounts of coverage? But I focus a lot on the type. You know, term insurance is like renting. If you stop paying premiums, the insurance goes away. Um, but there's all the more permanent products, kind of the whole life policies, the universal life, the variable universal life, the guaranteed products, or a second to die. And you'll use different products depending on what the goal is, what the purpose of that insurance is, and how you match that up. So when you think about purposes of insurance, for example, if the purpose is to provide for your family, if it's because there's a large mortgage and you want to make sure the family can stay in the house if you get hit by the bus, then maybe you're looking at a 20 or 30 year term policy because you're matching it to the mortgage. If you're thinking about living expenses that might go on beyond that, it may or may not be a permanent product you should be thinking about. If it was an education expense. Again, there's a finite date when hopefully the kids will be educated. And so that might be more of a term play. Um, if you think it's the state taxes, that's probably more of a permanent play, right? Because we have a liquidity event in, or liquidity concerns in our estate and how we fund that. So if we're thinking about that, then thinking about the estate taxes and the permanent nature of those, even though the um, exemptions keep moving on us, but that's probably more of a permanent product. And that might be a second to die product, depending on your setup, right? So that's where the different types will come into play. And inheritance, so you'd have to think about whether that's probably a permanent need or permanent want. Um, and should that be a second to die or is that a first to die policy, just a traditional policy and thinking about that and, and the timing when you want that to happen. Um, you know, philanthropic goals can be a reason people purchase insurance. If you have a, uh, a second family, if you will, like a, a second marriage situation, life insurance might be a permanent reason why you wanna have some insurance there as you're trying to take care of both sides there. Um, so again, do you have the right policy? For the right purpose, and then you can figure out if you have the right amount. But having that discussion about whether they have the right insurance can really add value to the relationship. If it's not a term policy, we want to ask kind of, is the policy healthy, right? If it's a term policy, you're kind of renting for the year. You want to make sure with a good company. You always want to make sure you're with a good company um, and look at the ratings on those. But when's the last time the client reviewed an in-force illustration? That just kind of is a good way to look at the health of the policy. If you find out that policy, if we don't start making large, pre large additional premiums to it in some type of like, say, a variable universal life policy, it's going to, you know, end at age 82 or 84 or something that needs to be addressed sooner than later. Or if it's going to end at a date that's not ideal, that should be addressed. We should always be looking at that with our eyes wide open. So understanding and making sure it's a healthy policy is important. Um, three other categories of insurance I have down here at the bottom. One is disability insurance. Um, if you have a high earner, maybe has a high um, bonus that they rely on for their lifestyle, that bonus is probably not covered in their corporate insurance um, disability insurance policy, which by the way, hopefully they're paying. So it's not taxable if they ever collect as opposed to the company paying it. But that's, you know, that's a discussion there too when you're thinking about how much disability insurance someone should have. Um, but if someone does rely, again, on that um, bonus, we should make sure there's some level of disability coverage around that. 
Long-term care insurance um, is harder to get now. It's always been hard to get, quite honestly, but it's harder to get now. There's fewer players in the field. I think hybrid policies that combine some type of a permanent life insurance product with accessibility for long-term care purposes has become much more popular, those hybrids. But if that is a concern of someone, it's something to address. And you're going to hear that in the fears. You know, Maybe you've, they've had relatives that have Alzheimer's issues or they've got a parent that they're helping through some type of long-term care events now and understanding that and helping them. You don't need to be selling it, but you need to be connecting with the professionals. That's how they're going to view you as kind of their advisor. Again, that's what we want to be. Property casualty insurance, um, you know, just asking, do they have proper coverage? You don't need to evaluate it. Let, let the insurance person do that. Make sure they're working with someone make, um, that, that they're comfortable with. But I just, I've met with people that have a boat with no insurance on it. Kind of a bad idea, just saying. Um, so, you know, things like that, ask the questions, like, do you have the right coverages there? And that brings me to one of my favorite insurance topics, which is umbrella insurance. Um, most of you are probably familiar with umbrella insurance. Basically, you know, you have insurance on your cars that has a liability limit. You have insurance on your multiple, your home or your multiple homes that all have individual liability limits. And then you have, if you have an umbrella policy that kind of goes over the top of those. So if there's an overarching claim or some other type of claim that isn't covered by that level of liability coverage, the umbrella insurance can be on top of that. It's often called an excess liability policy, right? Um, the big question there is how much is enough, right? And it, usually it's bought in multiples of, of a million. Um, and all of the people come in and be like, I have a million, I'm good. I'm like, mm, yeah, let's talk about that, right? Because what I always say is you want to make sure the insurance company is sitting on the same side of the table as you are. And what that means is their interests are aligned with yours, right? They're protecting you like you want to be protected. They're protecting themselves as they protect you. Because if you have a, a $5 million umbrella policy, for example, they might fight a little bit harder. If they think a claim is going to be a million dollars type of thing, if they have a million dollar policy, they don't think they can get out of it. They're going to look like, well, what's the, how much is this going to cost us on lawyers and whatever, we might be better off like writing a check for a million dollars than we are to fight this. But if they have a $5 million policy, they have more incentive to actually bring their lawyers and not their checkbook. And that's what I always say. I want to, I want to make sure the lawyers join on my side and not just the insurance company's checkbook. Any liability beyond the coverage I have, you know, comes to your personal assets or your client's personal assets. So making sure that's all aligned is really important. And with this, again, you don't need to assess their risk profile, but you can ask a few questions and then encourage them to go talk to their agent, right? You know, did their child just get their license? That's a little bit more of a risk profile. Um, even, even good kids have accidents. Um, if they own multiple properties, that could, you know, be a risk profile. Um, somebody slips and falls on multiple places where you can slip and fall, right? Um, I always joke about biting dogs, like you don't want to have a biting dog, right? Uh, if you have a trampoline, insurance companies don't always love that. And so you'd have to disclose it, but it's, it's a liability. Swimming pools are another potential liability. I already mentioned the boat, which is a potential liability. The thing you got to make sure or that the client needs to make sure when they talk to their agent is, are all of these things covered by this policy? Like if their boat isn't listed, if it's insured by somebody else and the umbrella carrier doesn't even know about it, that's important. If you have a property in Florida and you have a property in Massachusetts and your carrier doesn't know about the property in Florida because it's insured by another company, that's important to make sure that you know all those things are on the table when you're talking about your umbrella coverage and making sure that your client has the right coverage or encouraging them to make sure they have the right coverage. Um, board service is something you want to make sure any charitable board you're on has their own DNO insurance, of course, but, you know, disclosures there. Um, and then, you know, the other factors, clearly what your asset, asset base is, what you're trying to protect, what the earning potential is you're trying to protect and different pieces there. So as you think about an umbrella policy, those are, you know, some of the things to think about. Um, Moving on from risk management, I want to talk about credit reports and freezing your credit. I think this is a really easy discussion and gets people to think it's not to cause fear at all, but it's really just to bring an awareness. Um, at this point, I would say all of our information is out there. There's been enough credit breaches that you just kind of kind of assume that you and all of your clients that you're 
you know, important information is out there. Um, and if falling into the wrong hands can cause problems for you. So I ask people, when's the last time you reviewed their credit report? I don't wanna review their credit report. That's not what I wanna do, but I wanna make sure they are. I wanna make sure that they're getting it, accessing it. They're going through it, through it in detail. Are all the addresses listed on there actually their addresses? Are all the phone numbers listed on there actually their phone numbers? Are all the credit cards listed on there actually their credit cards? Are there any hard credit pulls on their report? that they didn't do. That's it's important, right? Make sure the mortgage is the right mortgage and all those different things. But um, we saw a lot during the pandemic with um, fraudulent unemployment claims. And only possible really because our information is out there. A lot of our information is already out there. Not because of anything we did, but there's just been breaches along the way, right? So what I encourage people to do the annualcreditreport.com is where you can go and you can get that one free credit report per agency, the three agencies being Experian, Equifax, and TransUnion. So, you know, the old, the old situation was you try to pull in every four months and that's how you stay on top of it. Um, but with the pandemic, um, the three agencies are now, if you sign up with them online, you can actually pull it weekly. So I don't encourage anyone to pull their credit report weekly, just like I don't, ex I don't encourage them to check their stock, stock values daily either. Um, but, you know, we, pulling it occasionally is a good thing. If you have a problem, obviously following up on that, pulling that more often is important. Um, but with pulling your credit report, I also ask them, have you frozen your credit? If you, your credit only needs to be open when you're actually starting a new credit relationship. That could be a mortgage, could be a credit card. It could be that you're financing your new iPhone um, with AT&T and they require to pull it too. But um, it's all those pieces, right? Where only you only have to have it open when you're accessing credit. And most cases you can say to the person you're working with, like which credit report needs to be open? Is it Experian? Is it Equifax? Is it TransUnion? And they'll usually tell you. And then you can go online, you can open it up for the day or for a couple days and tell it to automatically sunset and close on whatever date. And it's very easy to do as long as you maintain your login credentials, which is not hard to do either. Um, I think the important thing there is sometimes when you go on those sites and try to set up and freeze your credit, you know, they'll always offer a service for a fee. You can do this for free if you navigate it properly. Your clients can do this for free. And so I encourage people to at least do that, at least go in and freeze their credit. You should freeze, your 18 year old should freeze their credit. Your 82 year old grandma should freeze her credit too. Uh, it's, it's one of those things that should all be frozen. Um, sometimes uh, things aren't found for many years. Sometimes people find out when they're turning 18 and applying for a student loan that they've had, a, their credit's been compromised because stealing the social security number and credit history of a child is one of the best ways to, I'm told, is one of the best ways to have a long-term fraudulent run, right? Um, but so you don't want any surprises. You want to make sure that you're freezing credit and looking at those credit reports regularly. Um, if you have had an identity, um, your identity compromised in any way, you should file a report with the FTC at uh, identitytheft.gov. It's pretty self-explanatory to go there and do that. Along the same line, I always encourage people to also establish a My Social Security online account. Big reason being, I wanna do it so nobody else can. One of the worst places to actually have an identity theft problem is with the Social Security Administration. They aren't probably gonna issue a new social security number. That just doesn't happen too often. And so it becomes a real hassle. So you wanna do it so nobody else does. The advantage of doing it is you can go on and check to make sure your earnings are reported properly. That's actually a really good thing to do. And then you can also get projections. If I stop working now, what the numbers look like, if I earn this much, what's it gonna look like, those different pieces. And when it's time to file for benefits, it's a lot easier. If you wanna change your banking information after you filed for benefits, it's a lot easier. It's just good to have that My Social Security online account. And my next topic is credit cards, yes, debit cards, no. I, I tell my kids and anybody else that will listen that debit cards are ATM cards. I would not encourage you to use them at the gas station or the grocery store or anywhere else. That's a direct line to your checking account. It's a direct line to your client's checking accounts. And using those, it's, I'm not saying you can't recover what might happen if that number is compromised. 
but I am saying it's a lot harder to do than with my credit card. All I have to do is call my credit card company and say, shut it down, send me a new one. And the things that have happened on there, they're on the hook for, I'm not fighting about, I don't have to deal with, very easy to replace um, and a lot less hassle. I can't tell you, I use my credit card all the time. Um, I pay it off, but I use my credit card all the time. I cannot tell you how many times I've gotten a notification that my credit card has been used on a website or somewhere that wasn't me, right? And so I, you know, I've got my notifications set up pretty tight. I encourage people to do that too. So I do get those notifications, but it's a lot easier than thinking about, do I need to change my checking account? Because my checking account is like where everything happens, right? Where your money comes in, money goes out. Um, so I try to keep that more pristine and say, let your credit card be what you use online. Let your credit card be what you use at the gas station, not your debit card. And my last topic of, on the um, adding value to the relationship is estate planning. And going again with the open-ended questions here, the question is, does your estate plan reflect your current wishes? And then pause. They'll think a little bit. And, you know, sometimes they'll come back with, I don't have one, or maybe I just updated it last week, or we did it when the kids were little, they're 28 or 42 now, right? It's been a while. Or we have simple wills, but oh yeah, that was before we had that liquidity event. So they're probably not the right plan. So again, you're not going to draft their documents, but you're going to say, hmm, you should make that a priority. And then you put that on your list. So next time you sit down with them, again, remember I always said, you're gonna have the list of things you wanna make sure you cover. You know, Have you updated your state plan? And then you're, you're being their advisor. You're helping them remember what's, what needs to be important. Lots of times, you know, updating your estate plan, you don't wanna deal with the fact that people are dying and you're thinking about that, but it's important to do that. So helping them um, do that is important. And also, you know, making sure that they feel like they have the right parties named in the fiduciary roles. You know, we serve as corporate trustees, so I see a lot of different things happening on the trustee side, but making sure the right people that actually understand how the trust works and understands what a fiduciary duty is, is serving in that role. It doesn't have to be us, but it needs to be someone who's going to do it right. Is their personal representative the right one? Do they have the right attorneys, in fact, named on their powers of attorney? Do they have the right healthcare agent names? Again, not things you're going to do or you're going to draft, but asking those questions. One thing you, you should be asking, if they have an individual account with you, should that be in the name of the revocable trust? Helps them avoid probate, more private, can help with administration and paying bills if in the event of incapacity, which that becomes important too, potentially. Um, and then two more quick things here. Again, knowing the ages of those kids, when somebody's turning 18, does your 18 year old have a healthcare proxy? It is shocking to many people when they realize that they don't have any say to healthcare or making decisions without a lot more hassle um, once the child turns 18. They're still their child, feels, feels about the same as it did the day before they turned 18 to you as a parent, but legally you don't have that, the same rights. So making sure that your 18 year old has a healthcare proxy. I've literally gotten calls at 11 o'clock at night from clients saying, I know you have that online. Can you, can you get that to me? Because somebody's in an ER, right? It's important to know that they have that. Literally, I do drink my own um, Kool-Aid on this one. I have two kids that literally the day they turned 18, they were signing their healthcare proxies. And I know that sounds weird, but there's no better day than that day to make sure it's done right. You definitely want it done before they go to college, right? Um, all of this brings you back to the fact that as their advisor, you may be helping them find an estate planning attorney if they don't already have one. And again, being the center of their advisor relationship is really important. So just quickly, what have we talked about today? We've talked about building the relationship and the four strategies there, being intentionally present and actively listening, using open-ended questions, focusing on what's important to them in your discussions and what you bring to them. Know your relationship with money and make sure that does not negatively impact how you interact with them and your relationship with them and how you advise them. You can easily add value to the relationship by having the retirement discussion. Uh, you know, many levels of things there to peel back that one. Should they be think, considering Ross or you, utilizing Ross? Um, you should make sure their risk management is in place, asking questions so that they can make sure their risk management's in place, right? Life insurance, 
disability, long-term care, um, property and casualty, and also that umbrella policy is really important and often missed. Have they checked their credit reports? Have they frozen their credit? Are they using credit cards? Yes, but not debit cards, please no. And also, is their estate planning up to date? Does their 18 year old or young adult child have a healthcare proxy and other documents, but I focus on healthcare proxies there. And so that is, those are my prepared comments. Um, and so I thank you for your attention and I'm gonna turn to Dan to see if we have some questions that we should be talking about. Thanks, Jody. That's wonderful. Um, I have to say that uh, I'm taking your advice, and I, I will look into um, using using a Roth, um, and I will check into my umbrella insurance policy. Um, so you can send me the bill for your advice because those are two things that, as you were speaking, I thought to myself, "Huh, I'm missing something there." So thank you, thank you for that. Um, from a question perspective, there's a few questions. And let's go back to early on the building the relationship um, uh, section of your presentation. So uh, clients often don't tell you the whole story. And what are the kind of cues that you're looking for to identify when there's something more to the story that you need to that you need to hear? You know, I, I think it's really that listening piece, Dan. It's a good question because lots of times they have to trust you before they're going to tell you a lot of things and you know you have to kind of create that safe container where they can feel they won't be judged for sharing that it's in their best interest to share and it's okay to share and and then you're open to listening to it right because you know if, if you're rushed if you're not focused on them if you're ready to move on to the slides that you want to talk about then they're not going to feel compelled to kind of share that with you. So that pausing, that like nodding your head when you're listening, like not really interjecting, not directing where they go, but asking anything else. You know, I've sensed this. Is there anything else there? And pause, right? And so it's really just listening very closely to what they're saying and then asking whatever questions you can help to kind of peel that onion back and allowing that silence, allowing that pause, which can be uncomfortable and you need to get used to it and practice it with other people. Like, honestly, because um, it's interesting when I, when I have my colleagues until when I would, someone I haven't done a lot of planning with, like one of my uh, um, colleagues, I'll tell them like, you're gonna feel like you wanna jump in. You're gonna feel like you wanna interject because it's gonna feel awkward. Don't let 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 me manage that. Let let the let that kind of sit on the table. And then what they come back to me later and say is, wow, I can't believe they told you blah. Or I can't believe I've worked with them for so long, but I've never heard that. And it's all about creating that space, making it feel like it's okay to bring it up. And then once you know that, you again can be a better advisor to them. And it's really important that you want to be that advisor to them. They want you to be that advisor to them. And then when there's market volatility, it helps to smooth that because there's other things to talk about. And there's other reasons they value you than whether you chose Coke or Pepsi. That, that makes a lot of sense to me. And I, I, I remember earlier in my career, I had a boss who used silence quite often, uncomfortable silences. And I, uh, I remember being in, in his office and thinking, I'm going to tell him every single one of my secrets and anxieties just to fill the, just to fill the, the, the void in conversation. So I, uh, I, I can see the, the benefits there. So my, my second question, um, the second question from the, the group is about taxes. And uh, taxes are fresh in everyone's mind. Some of us are bruised over uh, over this most recent tax season. Um, can you can you talk about um, what some of the really common mistakes that you see people make in thinking about tax planning? Um, and what should we do to combat combat maybe some of our our uh, uh, unfortunate tendencies? Yeah, no, absolutely. So mistakes in tax planning are maybe it's opportunities in tax planning, right? <laughs> um, going the other way on that. I think that, you know, not taking advantage of the qualified charitable distribution for those age 70 and a half that have significant IRA assets 
is one. Um, you know, a lot of people with kind of the loss of the, or the, the limitation on the state and local tax deduction at 10,000, fewer and fewer per year, fewer and fewer people are itemizing. And so at least through, you know, 1231, 2025, with the sunset of that um, provision, at least between now and then, like lots of times what people are donating to charity, they're not getting a tax deduction for. And if they were do doing that using a qualified charitable deduction, they'd be getting a tax benefit, even if they didn't get the deduction, because the benefit is you're not recognizing the income, right? And you're still fulfilling the RMD. So that would be one. Um, two is with the mass millionaires tax, like really paying attention to where you're at in the um, kind of in the tax brackets, you know, both federally, but also for the mass to see if you're going over the million or not. And one that I think is probably not thought about by a lot of people, but which is kind of top of mind to me, as I mentioned, Medicare and retirement planning and kind of being aware of that, you know, the, the higher your modified adjusted gross income, the, the higher your Medicare costs are going to be if you're age 65, right? And the, the IRMA adjustment, they call it, um, income related Medicare adjustment, you know, you end up with paying more based on your tax return from like two years ago, right? And so being aware of that and being aware of the fact that um, what you do in a portfolio, or what somebody does in their financial life is gonna impact that. And so again, another advantage to using a qualified charitable deduction is because we don't ever recognize that income, it doesn't push up our modified adjusted gross income and therefore our IRMA adjustment, we won't pay more for um, Medicare taxes, if you will, or not Medicare taxes, Medicare premiums, because we've been smart about how we've made our charitable deductions. So I, I would put those out as a couple um, of things to think about along the way. That's great. And I think that is probably a good, a, a good place to end. Thank you so much for a great presentation, Jody. Um, I'll uh, do a virtual clap since the audience, uh, the, the audience can't clap, but this has been terrific. And um, thank you so much. Thank you, Dan. My pleasure.